Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Adventures Through the Mind podcast. I am your host, as always, James W. Gesso. This podcast explores psychedelic culture and the various nuances that sort of fit under or within the psychedelic culture umbrella. I've really, I guess, struggled, wrestled with how to communicate why that topic can include such a diverse set of topics. And recently upon reading uh, an essay in the, I believe, Oak Tree Review from Hendrik Dahl, there was a section that I felt really beautifully um, summed it up. And uh, instead of paraphrasing, I'm, I'm actually just going to read this quote directly. The quote is talking about psychedelic art and discusses psychedelic culture as a whole. It says, quote, its history consists of a somewhat complex mix of cultural references, which are often filled with symbols and signs, many of which initially had little or nothing to do with psychedelics. Therefore, being a researcher of psychedelia simultaneously entails making research in several different fields, such as anthropology, religion, history, the arts, the esoteric, psychology, and medicine. Only by using this eclectic, interdisciplinary approach is it possible to reach an understanding of why a certain motif is used in psychedelic art. Well, I feel this quote really accurately represents why this podcast takes such a, say, interdisciplinary approach to various topics. That being said, this episode's topic is blatantly psychedelic. It is an interview with Rick Strassman, the famous researcher behind the book DMT, The Spirit molecule. The Spirit Molecule was one of my first extensive reads on psychedelics. I had been fairly deep in my experimentation at that point, um, and I had only read, I believe, Heaven and Hell by Aldous Huxley. I had participated in, whew, wow, countless numbers of uh, Terrence McKenna audio lectures, and DMT, The Spirit Molecule, really fell in at the right place, just around, obviously, the time that I had begun experimenting with DMT and uh, actually led to a very intense questioning around my my level of commitment <laughs> to uh, to the psychedelic world and the psychedelic pathway. But that's sort of a topic of a different story. Needless to say, the book has stayed with me, even my very copy of it, which I read um, nearly a decade ago, has stayed with me in my physical possession. And the impact that it has had on my sense of self, my sense of reality, and my commitment to psychedelic research um, as a journalist and a writer has stayed with me as well. So it was really great to uh, to sit and have this conversation with Rick and uh, to get to sort of tease into some of my own thoughts around his work and hopefully have created a conversation that will be really enjoyable for you, the listener. A couple pieces to talk about uh, about this interview. It is not in video if you're normally watching this on YouTube. I'm sorry about that. I know recently there was another one uh, that was without video. I want to prioritize getting video as much as possible. When it comes down, however, to the fact that I am recording via Skype and there is the there is the trade-off to either have video and shoddy audio or better audio, um, the decision is, uh, is obviously a clear um, choice for me, which is to commit to higher quality audio as the primary, um, as the priority. That being said, there are still a few audio glitches, but for the most part, it is very clean. Another point is that this episode is sort of divided into three sections. The first section is talking about DMT in particular and sort of his thoughts on DMT and the larger, say, philosophical uh, 
tapestry uh, DMT fits into in regards to his own work. This includes DMT, the spirit molecule, as well as DMT and the soul of prophecy, his other major book on DMT. The second section explores his observations on the current project of mainstreaming psychedelics and where he sees there are some problematic themes or problematic issues that are emerging. The third is finally a collection of questions that I had for Rick directly from my patrons on Patreon, which is a good segue to telling you that this podcast is brought to you by listeners like yourself, primarily through Patreon, which is a platform where you can pledge a certain amount of money per month to me in the exchange of my commitment to continue producing this content for you in exchange for some awesome rewards that are exclusive to different patrons at different um, pledge levels. One of those um, opportunities, one of those rewards is the capacity to know which guests are being interviewed in advance and have the capacity to get your question asked directly to that guest. There are a collection of specific patrons who are giving significantly every month. And if you're watching this on YouTube, you will see their names represented in the top corner of the screen or their names will be written in the description. It is also funded through donations by PayPal and uh, various cryptocurrencies such as Litecoin or Bitcoin or Ethereum, which to that point, I would like to thank John and Catherine for their significant cryptocurrency donations. One final point before we get into this episode, I would like to thank Cannonot Becca for their five-star review on iTunes saying so many things to love about James's work. I recently put my finger on why I love James's interviews, something he said himself, and I couldn't state more succinctly and plainly. I'm summing up. He covers things that alter our sense of self, things that alter our sense of reality, and things that influence our moment-to-moment experience, especially those things that take us off kilter and force us to come to terms with things when they aren't the way we want them to be. Lots of, quote, things, eh? Beyond psychedelics, so many things, trauma, sexuality, death, etc., and all wrapped up in James's earnest, authentic, and raw honesty. Thank you, Ken and Becca, for that review, and I also invite the other listeners, if you would like to leave a review on iTunes, if it's five stars, I will read it on the show. Thank you very much for offering your attention to that intro. Here is my interview with Dr. Rick Strassman. Rick Strassman obtained his undergraduate degree in biological sciences from Stanford University and his medical degree from Albert Einstein College of Medicine of Yeshiva University. He trained in general psychiatry at UC Davis in Sacramento and took up a clinical psychotherapy research fellowship at UC San Diego. Joining the faculty at the University of New Mexico in 1984, he first studied pineal melatonin functions in humans. Between 1990 to 1995, he performed the first new U.S. clinical research with psychedelic drugs in a generation, focusing primarily on DMT as well as psilocybin receiving federal and private funding. He has authored or co-authored approximately 40 peer-reviewed scientific papers and served as a consultant to various government, nonprofit, and for-profit entities. His book, DMT the Spirit Molecule from 2001, has sold 160,000 copies, been translated into 12 languages, and is the basis of a successful independent documentary that he co-produced. He is co-author of Inner Paths to Outer Outer Space, 2007, and the author of DMT and the Soul of Prophecy. He is currently Clinical Associate Professor of Psychiatry at the UNM School of Medicine and lives in Gallup, New Mexico. Rick, welcome to the show. Uh, Thanks, James. It's a pleasure being here. Uh, your book, DMT, uh, The Spirit Molecule, was one of the first, uh, I guess, psychedelic texts that I got into um, back in my own sort of awakening to this, uh, this area of study. And uh, it played a pretty intense role on, um, on how I perceived the psychedelic experience for a long while and has been extremely, I'd say, influential on a lot of people that I know, and obviously such a wildly successful book, having been 
translated into so many languages, which I think is interesting how they might get some of those highly complex stories of people's encounters with DMT into uh, other languages and, and still hold the meaning of it. Um, but And also there was this documentary made about it. So my first question is, given the massive underground cultural uprising of DMT use and its related spiritual philosophies about the nature of reality, how do you feel about your book's role in that underground culture? Uh, I would say mostly quite gratified. Uh, the importance of DMT to understanding a lot of things about our universe, both inner and including the outer universe. Uh, lots of questions are raised about that through the presence and effects of DMT. Uh, and uh, I was really glad to be able to describe the behind the scenes uh, you know, mechanisms that uh, are necessary for doing clinical research. Um, and it's a good story, too. Uh, I mean, I was kind of the uh, lone wolf out there uh, trying to get this work performed after uh, a 20-year or so hiatus. Um, and, you know, it was uh, you know touch and go for quite a while. Um, you know, so there's a a fun and uh, you know hopefully inspiring story there, um, and obviously the accounts uh, of the volunteers are tremendous and uh, you know deserve as much circulation as possible. Uh, the one drawback has been with respect to people mistaking some of the speculation with established fact, uh, things like DMT being released at death or during birth, or 49 days, or things like that. Um, because I spend, I would say, a small amount of time, but you know, some time uh, every month you know, correcting um, misunderstandings uh, between you know, what's known and what was more speculation in the book. Mm -hmm. Definitely the... Um, the evolution of uh of the belief around dmt is produced in the pineal gland at birth and at death um has definitely taken on a lot of we'll say intermingling with the um, philosophies of the theosophical society and other dimensional access portals and um and consciousness expansion and the third eye and all of these things maybe you could um you could set the record straight for us here. So insofar as you know, is DMT produced in the pineal gland? And um, if so, is it produced at, at amounts that, um, that would be significant in any way? And do we have any real inclination as to what its role in the body might be? Uh, well, you know, there's a lot of questions there. Uh, I'll try to address as many as I can and then uh, you know, then some, uh, you know, it, it's been known for over 50, almost 60 years that the lungs produce DMT, uh, in the mammal, including humans, you know, so, uh, the, you know, uh, the pineal, uh, you know, DMT, you know, theory, uh, is cool. And I started thinking about it quite a long time ago. Um, you know, there wasn't any data you know, to support, you know, the presence of DMT in the pineal, but there was plenty of, you know, circumstantial data, you know, regarding the enzymes necessary, the precursors necessary, those kinds of things. Uh, and actually, uh, in 2013, a research group in Ann Arbor, Michigan, uh, did discover DMT in the pineal gland of the living rodent. Uh, you know, so that was quite gratifying. It was a, a you know, theory that I had put, uh, you know, out a long time ago in the early 1990s, late, you know, 1980s, you know, to, um, and, uh, um, so to see it, you know, validated was, uh, was quite satisfying. 
Um, you know, but even without a pineal gland, you know, people live a normal life. Animals live uh, a, um, a relatively normal life. Uh, you know, so even if there were significant DMT made by the pineal, uh, there still would be plenty of DMT being made in the lungs. Uh, you know, so the pineal you know, may make DMT only at special times, but uh, you know, that remains to be seen. Um, you know, the concentrations of uh, you know, DMT in the blood are very low, a trillionth of a gram you know, per milliliter of blood. Uh, the concentrations in the pineal gland are obviously quite low, uh, you know, very low. Uh, you know, but the interesting thing about the pineal gland is it secretes its products into the cerebral spinal fluid in the third ventricle. And that fluid also is in contact with, you know, sensory, you know, centers in the brain. Uh, you know, so it isn't, you know, quite that you need brain levels of DMT adequate to stimulate certain receptors. Uh, it's more, I think, a case of even small amounts being quite close to and being diffused onto um, other, you know, centers in the brain that may be involved in DMT's effects. Mm hmm Great. So let's 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 move on a little bit um, because when talking about DMT in uh, in the brain and, and its possible effects comes into kind of the I, I guess the the hypothesis of your second major book, which is DMT and the Soul of Prophecy. Now to start us off, maybe you could unpack what it is in the book you call theoneurology and how it differs from um, neurotheology. Yeah. Um, well, yeah, I could maybe provide, uh, you know, some background as to the genesis of the prophetic states book. Mm -hmm. um, you know, once I completed the DMT work, uh, the stories of the volunteers weren't consistent with what I expected would take place in the study. Um, I was coming, you know, to the research using the spiritual lens of Zen Buddhism, which I had been studying and you know, practicing for quite a few years uh, by the time the study began, maybe 15, 16 years, maybe 18 years. Yeah, you know, but, you know, quite a while. Um, and I was expecting, and most of the volunteers were expecting, um, a enlightenment experience. Uh, you know, the loss of the ego, the merging with the white light, uh, you know, the suspension of time and space. Uh, you know, no ideas, no perceptions, you know, no nothing. You know, just kind of the experience of emptiness, which, you know, isn't really empty, but still that's the closest approximation. Um you know, but the volunteers, instead of, you know, those kinds of effects, more described an interactive uh, universe or an interactive state of mind, which, you know, felt real, uh, was, uh, you know, full of things, uh, images, objects, uh, you know, forces, energies, um, and uh, they interacted with the contents of that state. Uh, and they maintained their personalities and uh, were able to, you know, willfully affect things. Uh, you know, so after the study was over, um, I s was interested in other spiritual models, uh, which would, you know, take into account an interactive relational, you know, kind of experience, you know, rather than a, you know, what I call the mystical unitive, um, which is the ego dissolving no time and space uh, you know, kinds of experience. Um, and, uh, you know, there were a number of circumstances that, uh, you know, directed me, you know, to the Hebrew Bible or uh, the Old Testament. Uh, and as I started reading it, uh, it, you know, seemed as if the prophetic experience was quite, you know, phenomenologically, you know, similar to the reports of my DMT volunteers. Um, you know, so it would be good to define 
the prophetic experience or you know prophecy um, because it's you know mostly understood you know these days as predicting or foretelling uh, but you know that's you know more of a uh, you know function of the translation into Greek of the Hebrew word for uh, the prophet um, in uh, the Greek uh, the term is prophetes which means to be able to see forward you know to predict the future and that was because of the Greek interest in using divination uh, as a means of you know foretelling you know but the Hebrew word is navi which you know most closely I guess could be you know translated as interpreter uh, or spokesperson uh, you know so in you know that you know context anyone who experiences in the text in the Hebrew Bible any kind of you know divine encounter uh, it could be purely emotional it could be verbal um, as we're you know more I'm um, accustomed to when thinking about you know prophecy it can be emotional perceptual any number of uh, you know altered you know mental functions um, insight inspiration all of those could be called you know forms of prophecy you know so when you've got that you know the larger understanding of the term you can uh, you can point to any experience any spiritual experience in the Bible is you know can be called you know you know can be called prophetic um, you know so the understanding of how the you know prophetic experience works is it's a communication from God and the brain in you know current parlance you know could be seen um, as the conduit you know for that uh, you know communication you know so it's a top-down model what I call you know theo neurology uh, and you know that is in uh, opposition to or in contrast or you know complementary to let's say um, you know the current you know paradigm which is which is called you know which is called uh, neurotheology a you know, bottom-up approach uh, in other words you know the brain is you know generating the impression uh, of communicating with God and the top-down model is you know the brain is uh, you know serves as uh, you know the channel of communication from God hmm. it's interesting I'm thinking about uh, sort of ancient science in the church um, being that uh, all of the universe revolved around us um, and then eventually getting to a point where we realize we're just part of one larger universe and seeing how you know modern science it's laughable to think that we are the center of the universe and yet there's this uh, there's this common theme that everything we experience emerges solely and completely in generation from the brain, like a neural centric view of reality. And yet there isn't this perception or the understanding that this may well very be the exact same thing that we think that we're the center of the universe and it's all us only to find out at some point that that, uh, that might very well be incorrect. Yeah, I think the, you know, the study of spiritual experience, uh, is a good you know, meeting point, you know, for you know science and uh, theology, and it and if we can understand, you know, both you know the mechanisms and the origination of these spiritual experiences, you know, combining you know science and faith, as it were, uh, it could uh, introduce the beginning of uh, you know revivic a you know revivication of you know the metaphysics of uh, the Middle Ages, which was quite sophisticated at the time. It uh, included astronomy, philosophy, you know, science, uh, you know, chemistry, um, you know, mathematics, you know, philology, grammar, um, and all of those you know disciplines were brought to bear on the spiritual experience. Um, in you know, this case, it was you know the prophetic experience. Uh, you know, so I think the you know separation of you know science and religion um, occurred just because of overreach on the part of the church. But uh, you know, there was a time when there was uh, you know quite a bit of cross you know disciplinary uh, you know fertilization of you know, both fields. Uh, you know, through the investigation 
using their own tools of the spiritual experience. Mm -hmm. Well, it's, uh, it's, it's undeniable that every subjective experience that, um, that we can report has some sort of uh, correlation of neurological activity. Um, so, I mean, that there's definitely some correlations there. And I, from what I understand, your book, The Soul of Prophecy, um, makes a case for DMT playing some sort of role inside, um, inside of modern prophecy, which I believe you explain that most Jewish scholars believe that prophecy as it is expressed in the Hebrew Bible ended around the fifth century, but, but you, um, you make the case that the essence of prophecy uh, is still alive today and that DMT uh, might be playing a role in that. Can you uh, unpack that a little bit? Um, well, the you know, similarities between the DMT state and the prophetic state um, you know, which I compared quite, you know, closely in the book that probably takes up about a third of the book is a, you know, somewhat tedious, but still, uh, an enlightening, uh, you know, comparison of uh, the two, you know, syndromes as it were, you know, the DMT experience and the prophetic experience. Um, you know, so the phenomenology is, you know, quite strikingly similar, uh, you know, the visions and the voices, the out of body states, the extreme emotions, uh, the you know, feeling of awe and what was taking place was as real or more real than everyday reality. Um, you know, but the content of the experiences were quite, you know, different. You know, the, um, the information content, you know, the message. Uh, in the DMT work, most of the content was... Uh, the description of that world, you know, phenomenological, uh, you know, the colors and the sounds and the feelings. But, you know, the information, you know, did they come back with any new ideas or any uh, ethical or moral or religious or e even, you know, scientific or, you know, creative, um, you know, new information? And, uh, uh, well, so that was, you know, rather meager. <clears throat> you know, but you look at... You know the information content of the Hebrew Bible. Uh, it's obviously been around for <clears throat> maybe three thousand years by now, and it's influenced you know Western society, you know Western civilization, uh, in all, I mean, all ways. <clears throat> uh, you know, philosophy, economics, uh, you know, morality, you know, the law, politics. Um, you know, so I started to, you know, wonder, you know, what is, you know, the difference between those two states? And uh, it, you know, boils down that it's, you know, the information content. You know, so that started me, you know, thinking, well, you know, what is DMT, you know, doing then? And uh, it appears to me anyway that most, you know, psychedelics, and especially DMT, uh, stimulate what's called the imagination, uh, and it's a you know technical term used by the medievalists. You know, the imagination is uh, the location of everything perceptible. Um, you know, so that includes the body and uh, you know senses uh, and emotions. Um, you know, so in your know, contrast, uh, you know, to the imagination is what's called the intellect and. Uh, you know, that's the location of the abstract, you know, kinds of notions out there, you know, mathematics, let's say, um, or, you know, kind of ideas which, you know, don't, um, you know, possess any, uh, you know, perceptible form. Um, you know, so I think that when you look at, you know, DMT, it, you know, may be, you know, mediating the visions, let's say, in the prophetic state, you know, but it isn't, you know, really, you know, mediating the information. Uh, you know, the information is, you know, being extracted, let's say, you know, from the imagination by the intellect. Uh, you know, so the angel speaks and, you know, the intellect understands it. Um, you know, but the angels in, you know, the DMT state, you know, weren't speaking that much. And if they were, it was mostly about their nature and their presence, you know, rather than any kind of information. 
any kind of, you know, content or any kind of teachings. You know, so I think in the prophetic state, you know, like I was, you know, like, you know, we were talking about a few minutes ago, it's a, you know, top down um, kind of process. Um, you know, if you look at it, you know, theologically, you know, God, you know, needs to address the community and then, you know, chooses a person. Uh, and then, you know, the influence, as it were, is, uh, you know, kind of emanated onto that person, both, you know, through the intellect and through the imagination. You know, so the visions are there and the intellect can understand what the message is. In the DMT work, you know, we were just, you know, purely stimulating the imagination, you know, from the bottom up. We were giving a drug um, as opposed to it being a... Uh, a occasion for you know divine communication which uh would originate outward or you know from the outside and uh, you know the content you know the information content uh, you know would also be at least you know first you know located um, outside of us as well hmm. well could could it could it be uh sorry i'm just like you just offered me a lot that i'm trying to unpack what i'm thinking here but could it could the lack of say prophetic type content in your DMT volunteers be less an extension of the bottom up use of administering DMT and more to do with context and understanding? Because even the uh, you know the ancient the ancient Israelites, according to some people, were utilizing exogenous substance such as uh, cannabosum, myrrh cassia um and and other things to be a part of things like their rituals in the in the tabernacle and and uh and with the holding anointing oil and such so would it be more to do with the fact that these people who are coming in have these preconceived notions they don't know much about it they're just in awe of what they're seeing rather than having had this deep sort of set to be interacting with the divine and and if so is it because i understand that in dmt culture and the dmt underculture there is some very interesting revelations that are that are coming out of that i, I mean pardon pardon the term there but uh that are coming out of this and so so do you believe that the only way that something prophetic can emerge in regards to a DMT type experience is if it's only as a subset of uh, God as an external agency impacting it upon a person spontaneously or within ritual and not from the ingestion of DMT exogenously regardless of set and setting? Um, here, let me think that through a bit. Uh, well, as you were starting as as you were beginning the question i was thinking about um you know why the dmt volunteers didn't get more information uh or you know at least uh information they could communicate uh as a result of their experience um and you know it does i think extend in to the rest of your question, uh, and let me kind of begin with, uh, you know, this, well, w with the idea of, you know, training the intellect, uh, you know, if we're still going to be using, you know, the you know, medieval, you know, technical, you know, terms of the intellect and the imagination, um, <clears throat> if, if you train your intellect, uh, if you kind of are, you know, grounded uh, in uh, abstract, you know, processes. I mean, can you, uh, you know, what is your skill in mathematics? What is your skill in grammar? What is your skill in, you know, debating and, you know, rhetoric? You know, what have you learned? What kind of things do you study? What kind of, you know, people, you know, do you uh, spend time with? Uh, you know, what's your life like? Uh, you know, your moral and your ethical life. You know, do you lead a, you know, virtuous life or, or, you know, do you lead a, you know, life, you know, filled with vice and corruption and those kinds of things? Um, you know, so the 
state that one attains when your imagination is stimulated by DMT, for example, either, you know, uh, <clears throat> I'm either from you know, the administration of it uh, or produced, uh, you know, naturally within the body, would depend on the state of one's intellect. Um, you know, you you can have you know psychedelic experiences without drugs. Uh, you know, meditation, prayer, you know, fasting, prolonged exposure to the dark. Um, you know, so those, you know, those, you know, can reveal important information, uh, both to the person and, you know, to the larger community. But strictly speaking, it isn't a uh, experience of, you know, prophecy. Because, you know, if we're going to be uh, sticking with, you know, the term or, you know, to be, uh, you know, precise, you know, the prophetic experience is a, you know, top down, you know, kind of, you know, phenomenon. Uh, it's the communication between humans and God. And it's, you know, a man has begun by God. It's, it originates in God and, uh, you know, the information uh, is, you know, contained uh, in a manner of speaking you know, by God. Uh, but, you know, that isn't, you know, to preclude great, you know, value, you know, coming from, you know, bottom up uh, experiences with any, you know, psychedelic or in particular with DMT. Hmm. So I'm, and so in thinking about the, the saying or the phrase, you know, God works in mysterious ways. And I'm wondering about whether or not, it would, and, and, and maybe I'm, I'm, of course, misinterpreting what you're saying, so please correct me if I am. But I'm wondering if it really needs to be on the outside, just this spontaneous emergence of spiritual type encounter for it to be prophetic. Or, I mean, could God be working in a way that is, you know, leading people subconsciously to contexts and scenarios to work with DMT from this exogenous way? And so my question there is like, how at that point is it possible to really differentiate between what is say fundamentally prophetic a direct you know line from god um and and what is uh what is a psychedelic experience that is personally meaningful but has no direct relationship to the to this external agency of god um Well, when you're speaking about, you know, prophecy, you know, what do you mean? Well, I'm, I'm thinking about it in the sense of the way that um, from from as far as I understand what you're saying or my interpretation of what you're saying, which is uh, a, a direct encounter with a divine being or entity in some way that imparts truly valuable um, and transformative information uh, that uh, furthers that person or even a larger community's relationship and understanding of the divine and what it means to be alive in this world. Well, so the uh, specific, you know, criterion is is an encounter with a spiritual entity or a spiritual being external to us. Okay, so then in that case, DMT seems to produce encounters with what is perceivably spiritual beings that are different from us. Like, how do we know that what um, people are describing as entities and aliens, and I mean, like, to to quote McKenna's famous, um, you know, self-driven mach dribbling machine elves, like how do we know that these aren't, you know, divine encounters that modern psychonauts aren't the Isaacs, Jacobs, and Jesuses of the modern world? Well, I mean, we would have to establish, you know, that they were, you know, like, well, like, you know, how would we know that they were, you know, direct encounters? Mm -hmm. But how would we know that it was a direct encounter with God? Well, because at least in uh, the text, you know, those are articulated, you know, those are laid out. Um, well, you know, this kind of uh, would be a good opportunity to introduce the notion of, you know, false prophecy. Mm -hmm. 
you know, because I mean, obviously you need to be able to differentiate. Uh, is what you're experiencing or, you know, somebody else experiencing, you know, true prophecy or is it false prophecy? Um, and, you know, to be honest, I don't think there's any really cut and dry way to distinguish between the two. You know, like, you know, there isn't one criterion uh, that, okay, you know, this is it. Uh, you know, but, you know, the text and you know, the medievalists, you know, lay out a number of criteria. Um, the most, you know, fundamental one, I think, uh, the, you know, the most, you know, consistent one is if it is consistent with, you know, two things, uh, which are the two main messages of the Hebrew Bible. You know, the existence of one God, uh, which is a, you know, belief, um, and the golden rule, which is a, you know, means of interacting. Uh, you know, with the outside world, you know, so if the information that you're receiving or communicating, you know, goes against either of those, then probably it's not what would be called, you know, prophetic uh, in, you know, the usual sense. And so uh, what you mean to say by that is in the usual sense, in the sense of how prophecy is understood in the Hebrew traditions, is that right? Or are you make are um, you making a claim? I'm just curious if you're making the claim that that like what's contained in the Hebrew Bible and the prophecy as it is described with that is um is an inherent or fundamental truthful description of prophecy as it is, where in the Hebrew Bible would be the the primary text model or understanding like the truth with a capital T in so far as mankind's relationship with God whatever God might be? Um, well, the prophetic experience, um, at least, you know, the way that it's used, you know, generally, uh, is an encounter with God or God's intermediaries, you know, the angels or God directly. Uh, you know, some, you know, believe, you know, that it's only the intermediaries, but, but, but still those are intermediaries between humans and God. You know, so the... You know, the, you know, source of the information is God as opposed to, um, as opposed to intermediaries like, you know, gods and goddesses and angels and beings and, uh, and aliens. I mean, you know, those could be intermediaries from God or between humans and God, those angels, those, those gods, the, uh you know, the beings, the entities, you know, but they may not be. And so that's where you look at, you know, the data or, you know, the information. Is it consistent with, uh, you know, paradigmatic prophetic text, uh, which is the Hebrew Bible? And the, you know, two main teachings are the one is the golden rule and one God. You know, so if, if we're going to be using the term of you know, if we're going to be using, you know, the term, you know, the prophetic experience, uh, you know, then it's, you know, it's, it's, you know, defined by the Bible. It's, you know, it's, you know, defined by the Hebrew Bible. Um, you know, that's the benchmark. Uh, if you're going to be, you know, using the term, you know, prophecy, you know, so is what is occurring in the DMT subculture, are the teachings coming out of it? consistent with the notion of one God and the practice of the golden rule. Hmm. Mm -hmm. Definitely some interesting stuff to chew on there, Rick. Um, I have another question is like, if, if, um, if that's the case that, um, that these are the two benchmarks and they're contained within the Hebrew Bible, then could the same, like, what is, what is your, I mean, now we're getting kind of slightly off DMT, but what are your thoughts around, uh, around <laughs> things okay. like the Bibles of Christianity and, and the Quran? Like these are also, um, I mean, this is again, really, uh, tricky political ground. So I understand if you wouldn't want to answer it, but then how, how do you feel about the, the list of different prophecies that emerged that led to the creation of, um, oof, well, the creation of the modern Christian Bible is a bit of a, a tricky story, so we can leave that. But like the things like um, 
like Muhammad as as a prophet and Jesus as a prophet? Uh, well, you know, they both you know take from the Hebrew Bible, both Christianity and Islam and their texts. So I would say, you know, go with the oldest, you know, tradition and the oldest text and the one that's been around the longest, uh, which, you know, the other ones I'm either borrow from or use to support their particular beliefs. Um, yeah, I think, you know, the older and the more enduring, uh, I believe, probably is the place, you know, to go. Cool. Well, th- thanks for uh, thanks for going to that uh, that precarious political ground with me, Rick. Um, I want to move on to some of your more recent additions uh, to your body of work beyond necessarily your work with DMT and your books, which is your current series of blogs on uh, on the mainstream of psychedelics, which are very interesting. So I want to just bring up some of the main issues you've talked about. Um, sort of like one by one, and then get you to offer us a brief rundown of, of, of that problem and why you see it as a problem, and if you perhaps see a solution to that um, to offer it. The first one is stifling inquiry into the full nature of the psychedelic experience through fundamentalism, dogmas, and orthodoxies in the biomedical model for psychedelics. Uh, well, that's kind of strongly worded, uh, but I guess I wrote it. (laughs) Um, well, let's see. Yeah, I mean, the purpose of my blog was to kind of give a legacy statement, uh, from someone who's been there and done that and, uh, you know, kind of moved on to, in a lot of ways, other things than, you know, psychedelics. It's kind of like, well, if I don't write anything else about, you know, psychedelics, I will have stated it in this blog. Um, You know, so even though I'm discussing, you know, some of the problems with the field, uh, that isn't to, you know, suggest, you know, that I'm not completely thrilled with, you know, the, uh, you know, progress, which you know, has been made in studying the, you know, psychedelic, you know, drugs in humans, uh, you know, therapy, spirituality, creativity, understanding how the brain works. Um, yeah, it's just been an explosion of, uh, you know, data generation the last maybe, you know, 10 or 12 years. Uh, you know, so the questions, um, you know, that I raise uh, in the blog are more things which I see, you know, kind of, you know, creeping in, uh, you know, to the field, which might uh, stifle the full, you know, exploration of the you know, full psychedelic experience. So I think the main thing we need to be careful about uh, when looking at these, you know, drugs and uh, their effects is to not glorify them and to not render them innocuous. You know, so there's a you know fine line or a, you know constant kind of tension between those two approaches, either glorifying them or making them innocuous. Uh, you know, because the full you know psychedelic experience, I mean, it's a, a you know glorious event, <laughs> and uh, it's changed many people's lives, you know, for the better, you know, some for the worse, but the majority, I would say, for the better. Um, you know, so it's easy to get over-enthusiastic and exuberant, um, but at, at the same time, you don't want to render them innocuous and, you know, say, well, they're, you know, just like any other drug, um, or, you know, don't have, you know, severe kinds of side effects in, you know, some people. Um, you know, you need to be, you know, clear eyed and, uh, you know, not overreach, uh, or underreach, uh, when, uh, you're describing, studying, communicating about, you know, psychedelic drugs. 
Mm -hmm. And so do you, do you see any particular, um, do you see any particular problems with, um, with the politics um, and the politics of language, the political correctness of language uh, being utilized inside of the psychedelic field right now to sort of contain everything inside of this inside of this um, model, um, this model that they are medicines uh, for therapy. Uh, yeah, you know, it, it's an extremely, you know, delicate issue or, you know, quite a few, you know, delicate issues. Um, you know, because these studies are occurring in academic, you know, settings, you know, there's this, uh, you know, political correctness, like you mentioned, uh, you want to, you know, shave off any, you know, rough edges or stark contrasts, uh, between and among things, you know, so, you know, for example, the, there's terms being used in the you know clinical research you know world which uh, you know seem to be more political you know seem to be more politically correct you know than accurate you know from a you know clinical point of view or you know from a research you know point of view you know so you know some of those include the you know notion of you know psychedelics you know being the occasion you know for the experience you know that you know psychedelics occasion you know, certain kinds of effects, you know, that's a, you know, kind of a vague word. I mean, uh, there are more, you know, direct ways of expressing what occurs after you, after you take a, uh, um, after you take a, you know, psychedelic drug, uh, the drug, you know, causes the experience. Uh, without the drug, there would be no experience like that at that time. You know, so to, you know, call it occasioning means this the occasion for, but I mean, there's a lot of occasions for lots of things. I think a, you know, more direct um, and, you know, shortest route between the drug and the effect is it causes the effect rather than occasioning the effect. Um, you know, there's... Uh, you know, notion of, you know, challenging experiences uh, and a questionnaire now developed to give a numerical, you know, value to uh, challenging experiences on, you know, psychedelics. But, uh, you know, there's a lot of uh, things which, you know, fall into the category of, you know, challenging um, from, you know, very minor to very major uh, you know, so it seems to be a, what is it? It's a, it, it's a new term, which is, I think, supposed to replace the term of an adverse effect or an adverse uh, response um, or um, an adverse reaction, you know, to a drug, uh, which is being given. So I think it's a term which really isn't necessary and it kind of, you know, renders innocuous, you know, some, uh, you know, severe adverse effects which, you know, can come about from, uh, you know, you know, from taking, you know, psychedelic drugs. Um, you know, so those are, uh, you know, two examples, um, anyway, of, uh, you know, how political correctness, either glorifying or rendering innocuous can, uh, can interfere with, uh, you know, direct observation and communication of what the experience is like, um, what causes it, uh, what's good about it, what's bad about it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. I see, I see both of those examples as, as being a uh, really, really prominent one, uh, especially when trying to, for example, present to the general public or to a scientific um, audience, uh, like an academic audience who, um, seems from, from my vantage point, uh, seem to embrace a fairly, uh, physicalist paradigm a lot of the time to say taking psilocybin caused mystical experiences is a, is a lot of a bigger statement to say that it appears as though the administration of psilocybin occasioned mystical type experiences. 
Um, and definitely with challenging experiences too, uh, you know, there's a huge difference between being uh, physically uncomfortable um, and uh, feel, feeling some sadness, which is very challenging, uh, which can be a challenging experience to um, having a complete freak out, dissociating and um, and ending up with some form of post-traumatic stress disorder because of a um, inappropriate dosing at the wrong times in the wrong scenario. So I think it's really good to, um, I think those are two really good examples that you offered there. Yeah. And, you know, uh, there's no, you know, problem with the concept of an adverse effect. I mean, you know, there's mild ones, there's moderate ones, there's severe ones, there's acute, there's subacute and there's chronic, you know, so, um, you know, there's, you know, temporary, there's permanent, uh, or, you know, somewhere in between, you know, so I think the, you know, current, you know, nomenclature, uh, is completely fine. And if there's an attempt to mainstream psychedelics within a biomedical model, I think to make up these terms or these ideas like occasioning and, you know, challenging, you know, those are not, you know, mainstream kinds uh, of expressions or understandings within, you know, clinical medicine. You know, so you can't, it's, you know, kind of like you can't have it both ways. Either you are a member of the, you know, world <clears throat> of, of, you know, clinical work, um, or you're not. Um, you, you know, so I think, you know, that is uh, the challenge, you know, so to speak, uh, you know, facing, um, you know, the you know, research world in its attempt to make these drugs more available. Hmm. Uh, as like maybe a little bit of a, of a devil's advocate game here, wouldn't it, wouldn't it lead to reason that any, that being that the clinical work is science and science um, is sort of founded in this idea that it should be able to grow and evolve over time as new evidence comes in, that given psychedelic drugs are uh, fairly different <laughs> in what they offer a person and what the nature of the experience is compared to most other psychiatric um, drugs used in clinical medicine, that it would require some sort of shifting of the language. For example, uh, you could say that um, being tremendously sad was an adverse effect, but yet inside of the psychedelic experience, maybe that you know, ad acute adverse effect um, actually was an important process somebody had to go through inside of a inside of a therapeutic container in order to garner a better understanding, which would then lead to say, well, that's just a challenging experience as a part of the the intended effect, which maybe in that particular scenario is is therapy. Do you do you think um, do you think that it's to some degree, there is there is room for evolving the clinical language to make room for this new, well, m new modern form uh, of medicine. And if yes, then how do we differentiate between playing the political correct game um, and evolving the language as needed to make a place for this these medicines? Um. Well, there's, yeah, I guess you're asking, uh, there were maybe two questions there. Um, the first was about being ex extremely sad as an adverse effect um, and whether, you know, challenging captures more accurately or carefully that kind of experience. Um, you know, I just don't think I would call being extremely sad in a deep psychedelic state either adverse or challenging. Um, I think it's just part of, well, I guess you could call it, you know, challenging, but by kind of using, you know, challenging as an umbrella term for adverse effects in general, I don't think is wise. Uh, you can think of extreme, you know, sadness as challenging, but you wouldn't, you know, necessarily, and you wouldn't call it, and you wouldn't call it an adverse effect. Um, only if that extreme sadness extended, you know, beyond the acute effects of the drug and was severe disabling. Um, you know, so uh, 
Yeah. Yeah. You know, sadness isn't an adverse effect. It might be a you know, challenging effect and it you know, would be reported if you were looking for challenging experiences, but it wouldn't, wouldn't you know, be reported. It wouldn't be reported at, um, as an adverse effect. You know, so, you know, the biomedical model and, you know, political correctness and a new, you know, model. Uh, well, you know, there's a lot of ways to look at the, you know, psychedelic experience. Um, and the you know, biomedical model is one way. Uh, so I think if you're going to play the biomedical model game, you need to play by those rules. But if you want to establish or if you want to study these drugs using other modalities, I think you could. But you wouldn't necessarily you know, call it biomedical. You know, there's you know, the shamanic, there's the psychotherapeutic in a more, you know, kind of uh, unstructured manner. Uh, there's, you know, creativity. Um, you know, there's a lot of ways to use, you know, psychedelics that wouldn't, you know, necessarily be within the biomedical model. You know, right now, uh, and I guess that was part of your question, but, you know, right now, I think it would be more underground. You know, it would be underground, but it could still be discussed you know, published, uh, but it, you know, would be under the current, you know, laws, it would be uh, illegal. You know, so that, I guess, you know, gets to your question about, well, are there new models? Uh, but, God, that's, you know, such a, you know, far-reaching, uh, you know, like, you know, could the, you know, could the larger culture think of, you know, psychedelics, as completely mainstream, uh, yeah, I just don't think that is going to happen. So, you know, there's, you know, the biomedical model has got the permits, it has the government, it's, you know, because it's, you know, it uh, is, you know, the bureaucracy. And, you know, there's uncontrolled or un, 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 un you know, biomedically controlled um, use. But, I think all because it's uncontrolled and, uh, you know, off the record doesn't mean it, you know, can't be studied and, you know, published about and spoken about. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I definitely, definitely on board with you there. Uh, as a point of clarification, uh, my question wasn't if there was new models, cause that, that there, de there definitely is like constantly new ones emerging from the minds of interesting people. Uh, but more or less, does science and biomedicine, uh, given the fact that, you know, biomedicine is a, is a scientific, uh, discipline, should it make room to change and evolve its own model, um, in the light of, uh, of new evidence to consider something different, I guess was where I was going with that. Yeah. Um, well, in what kind of way or, you know, for example, um, Okay, like for for example, um, it, from what from my understanding, the sort of biomedical approach to clinical depression is to first to give them uh, drugs with the hopes of suppressing their symptoms um, and giving them back a better quality of life. Where the psychedelics might introduce an entirely different consideration is that. Um, not to suppress their symptoms to give them a better quality of life, but to put somebody in a safe environment to go through and completely, um, hopefully unpack and understand the root of who and why they are, how they are, and how they've come to be depressed and come to some sort of emotional resolution or understanding that are, removes the symptoms at the root of it. So that would then lead to an entirely different consideration of the treatment of depression. And it also brings to light considerations around removing a, a, a neural centric idea of depression being a brain disease and, and more looking into um, depression being less a brain disease and more, um, more a uh, psychological, emotional and social spiritual issue that manifests um, as a observable brain disorder. And that, that would be like an evolution of the biomedical model uh, based on new evidence. 
Yeah, well, when you're treating depression with with the antidepressant drugs like you know Prozac in any event, I, you know, those are supposed to return you know someone to their previous state, you know, rather than you know suppressing symptoms. Uh, you know, theoretically, there's you know, you know, the concentrations of you know serotonin at uh, the synapse in depression are too low, and antidepressants will increase its availability. You know, you know, back to uh, you know, back to previous levels. Um, and also, you know, when you are treating somebody with antidepressants, you're still doing psychotherapy with them. It, you know, might be short, it might be, you know, pretty minimal. But there still is a person who is, you know, taking the drug, uh, who's, uh, you know, got some life stressors, some spiritual questions that aren't being addressed. But, you know, that takes, you know, but all of that, the response to an antidepressant and, you know, the psychotherapy, you know, take a long time, um, you know, months and years. Um, when you're using, you know, psilocybin, let's say, in a, you know, psychotherapeutic way, in, in, in your description, you know, catharsis and, you know, getting to the bottom of it, um, there still would be the integration afterwards which most you know helpfully would be in the you know setting of you know some kind of psychotherapy as well you know so i i think they're you know not quite as you know dissimilar as you you know might be you know making them out to be hmm i guess um and thank you for that response i uh i'm less thinking about them as being fundamentally dissimilar and one being an evolution of the other especially given um, you know, evidence to report that the, say, positive outcome of depression treatment with psilocybin seems to be directly correlated with, um, you know, questionnaires reporting that they've had a mystical type experience, which would then bring into biomedicine the consideration that these aren't just, this isn't just a brain issue that we need to bring them back to their normal baseline of serotonin, but there's some underlying something that's going on there that's directly associated with their, um, with their inner sense of spiritual identity, which is certainly going beyond the biomedical model, but in having observed that in clinical research, uh, would need to then be included or at least considered to be included in the evolving biomedical model in regards to the treatment of depression? Well, you'll still be using, you know, psilocybin in the future, let's say, you know, for depression. Um, yeah, but it would still be looked upon within the community, the, you know, psychiatric, you know, community as a, you know, biological response uh, with, you know, psychological components. Um, you know, you know, because at uh, the same time that they're looking at responses to questionnaires uh, as correlating with improvement in mood, uh, you know, there also are you know brain imaging studies which are you know pinpointing where in the brain is activated these particular you know kinds of experiences. You know, you know where are th you know where are these experiences located in the brain? Um, you know, so I think at, you know, bottom, it's still going to be understood at least strongly biological, uh, if, you know, not entirely, um, you know, which then leads me to thinking about the placebo response, mm -hmm. uh, which I think is playing a big role in much of what we're, uh, you know, seeing, uh, with respect, you know, to all of the conditions which are responding to psilocybin is, you know, that they are making, you know, more effective in a way, you know, traditional treatments, you know, for those disorders in the first place, you know, psychotherapy in particular. Um, you know, so if, you know, psychotherapy is influencing, you know, the outcome in an enhanced, uh, you know, way, you know, through the use of the psilocybin, you know what does you know what is that you know saying about uh, 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 um, the biology of you know psychotherapy? Um, you know it is you know working on uh, the unconscious, as does placebo. So I think there's going to be some interesting discoveries. Uh, and if you're looking at the uh, studies of you know brain imaging. 
you know, those areas lighting up, you know, may as much, you know, be a response or, you know, the way in which the enhancement of placebo takes place as uh, um, as much as, you know, the location of an antidepressant effect or a mystical experience. Mm-hmm. Yeah, definitely some uh, some interesting ponderings there, Rick, and, and definitely the, uh, the idea of how this new research is going to open up our understanding of, um, of the biology of of, of the biological aspects of psychotherapy and stuff. We're definitely on the same page there. I find it some very interesting room to grow, and I'm excited to see what comes out of it all. And also, it almost comes back to this question when you mentioned psilocybin being administered and the changes in the brain. It almost goes back to that question earlier about um, about there being an obvious correlation between inner subjective experience and uh, neurological activity and wondering about... Um, uh, about causation, uh, what is you know what is the cause, what is the correlation, where the information is coming from, um, and some interesting ponderings there, maybe slightly beyond the scope of what we have left for time in the interview, because I would like to uh, ask you about a couple other problems that you have noticed uh, or have written about in the process of mainstreaming psychedelics. This one is. Non geez, non clinicians advocating for policy changes with clinical implications, specifically attempts to reschedule psychedelics. Uh, yes, the the whole scheduling issue with you know the advocates of you know you know more accessibility uh, for you know psychotherapy, uh, end of life care smoking and alcohol abuse, other addictions. Uh, yeah, in order to make those, you know, treatments more, you know, widely available, you know, there's a push to reschedule, you know, psychedelics to schedule three uh, or schedule two. You know, but anybody, you know, with a DEA license, I'm a dentist, an orthopedist, a psychiatrist, pediatrician, uh, you know, veterinarian, you know, can prescribe schedule two and three substances, you know, so, you know, how will this rescheduling, you know, differ from anybody else prescribing any other schedule, you know, two or schedule Mm. three drug? It, you know, seems to me there ought to be a new schedule made, which would allow access in a greater manner, but would also impose unique regulations and, you know, certification requirements. Um, yeah, you know, monitoring uh, of use and those kinds of things. Mm-hmm. You yeah. know, like a 1A schedule, you know, something like that, you know, like a 1A. For sure. And then, I mean, for myself, I'm, I'm, I I want to see psychedelics brought into medicine so that the people who are hurting uh, can get help that or get healing that really helps them. Uh, I'm also a fairly strong advocate for, um, for general, for general access to psychedelics amongst the populace without fear of, um, without fear of the government coming in and possibly killing you on their way into your home to take your three or five hits of acid that they found out that you had, or, you know, arresting you for the rest of your life or something like that. Um, but I believe in cognitive freedom and access. I also believe in control and education as well. So possibly a whole new law specifically around scheduling the various different forms of use of, uh, of psychedelics should, uh, should, and hopefully will come about. Well, I mean, scheduling in a lot of ways regulates, you know, medical use. Um, it, you know, regulates it, but it does, you know, uh, I'm at uh, the same time as you note, uh, I'm exert, you know, some legal uh, strictures, which are, you know, pretty, you know, heavy handed, you know, considering. Uh, so, yeah, it's a tough one. I'm glad I'm not a politician. <laughs> I'm, I'm glad you're not a politician too, Rick. Um, let's, let's get into uh, this, this, this last one, this last problem I want to ask you about. Uh, this is an interesting one and also goes back to our earlier discussion, which is homogenizing widely disparate religious traditions by proposing that they all share a quote common mystical core yeah well that's uh 
you know, common meme, uh, you know, the mystical experience, which is the core of all religions, is it's, you know, good and good for you. Uh, it helps with your addiction. It helps with your depression. It helps with um, your end of life issues. You know, so I, I just don't think it's quite that simple, you know, that, uh, you know, there's a, you know, core religious experience. Uh, I, I think there are huge benefits to using psychedelics, um, at least what we've been, you know, seeing. I mean, this is, it's, it's astounding, you know, but to extract certain elements of this state and then to posit those elements in some combined way as being curative, um, you know, it would be okay if it wasn't called religious or spiritual or, you know, mystical, you know, but those are religious terms, you know, mm -hmm. theological terms, which, you know, carry quite a bit of baggage and also have been defined and discussed over millennia. You know, so to, you know, propose that, you know, the prophetic experience, which is interactive and relational, isn't a core feature of religious uh, experience. It's a little discriminatory, mm -hmm. um, you know, at least against a particular type of spiritual experience. Um, if you want to call it a, you know, peak experience that everybody's got access to, that's fine. But to, you know, clothe it in religious terms, I think, starts to, uh, you know, starts, you know, to raise some issues. I mean, you know, what are, you know, so, you know, what are devout, you know, let's say Christians, Jews or Muslims, you know, going to, you know, say or respond to, well, you know, the you know, core of your tradition is this. Hmm. It's what occurs when you take psilocybin. <laughs> you know, I think you'll you know find some resistance. Uh, so, I you know think it's an example of overreach. I think you know calling the effects peak, let's say, are you know that's fine. That's fine. It you know it you know secularizes it, and you know keeps it out of you know the realm of you know theology. You can go there if you want, but you wouldn't, you know, necessarily, you know, hang your hat on, you know, the whole, you know, notion of some, you know, core religious experience. Mm -hmm. Yeah, great, great perspectives there. Thank you, Rick. So, Rick, mov moving on from where you perceive the issues and the problems arising in the mainstreaming psychedelics process. I want to ask you a couple questions that come directly from my patrons. Uh, this show is funded by a community of people who volunteer uh, amounts of money to pledge to the development um, and the production of this podcast. And one of the things that they get to do is ask questions specifically to guests that are coming on the show. So I have a couple here. The first ones are, is what are your opinions of Chenga? as it relates to pure DMT? Well, you know, I've heard of uh, Changa, but <clears throat> I just don't know that much about it. Um, you know, so what is it exactly? Is it a smoked mixture of DMT and MAO? No containing plants? Yeah, typically it's, um, it is DMT infused into some sort of... Uh, leaf substrate which includes either extracted um, uh, beta carbolines or plants that contain it such as um, cappy leaves or shavings of uh, of the cappy vine with the proposition that there are there are free based harmulas that are absorbed and the general uh, premise, uh, though obviously not every time, is producing long duration sub breakthrough DMT experiences. Hmm. That's interesting. Uh, yeah, well, you know, buyer beware. That's all <laughs> I would suggest. Okay. Uh, actually, here's a question. Um, I've heard some people say that it would be impossible for uh, free base harmalas to impact DMT metabolism because uh, monoamine oxidase is produced in the stomach. Do you, are, are you able to confirm or deny that statement? Uh, I, yeah, I just don't know. Okay, no problems. So the second question, 
um, has to do with, I think, what might be one of the biggest DMT science breakthroughs, <laughs> like breaking news of late. Got a lot of um, got a lot of hits on the Facebook, which was the um, the introduction of a DMT infusion process <laughs> developed by right. you and Doctor, I believe it's pronounced Gallimore, uh, to maintain the state for longer durations. Maybe you could just give a little explanation on that. And then the question, which I think is very interesting um, from my patron, is um, is why would you do this and to what point? Uh, well, you know, in my DMT book, I describe the, the state of DMT, of you know, getting one injection. Um, you mean of DMT, big, the spirit molecule? Right, right, yeah. the spirit molecule. Yeah, it's a very, uh, it's an extremely short experience. Um, and we prolonged it or at least extended it or put you know, people in that state for a longer period of time through the tolerance study, you know, giving a big dose every half hour, you know, four times in a morning. And interestingly, there was no tolerance. The you know, psychological response was as robust the fourth time as the first. Um, you know, so in the spirit molecule, I you know suggest if you want to extend the state, you might want to develop a continuous infusion because there was no tolerance. Um, in other words, you know, theoretically, you would give it and you wouldn't. Uh, you know, stop responding to it. It would, you know, continue, you know, to, uh, you know, cause an effect. Uh, and a couple of years ago, Andrew Gallimore, young British, you know, scientist who's in Japan now, uh, approached me and wanted to, you know, put together a, a manuscript, you know, you know, describing a, you know, way of, you know, giving it, you know, the rates and the concentrations and the doses and those kinds of, you know, parameters he spelled them all out, uh, you know, using you know, sophisticated pharmacokinetic models. Um, yeah, you know, so, uh, you know, there is interest in that technique. Uh, you know, nobody's doing it. It's not been done in animals either. Um, so, you know, well, there's, you know, clearly interest in it, but... Um, it, it isn't uh, being planned anywhere at this point. Um, y you know, there is a study occurring in London at Imperial College where they're giving DMT, you know, single doses uh, and scanning their brains. Mm -hmm. Christopher you know, so, Timmerman. Chris Timmerman, yeah. yeah. You know, so that's the only active DMT, you know, lab right now. You know, so that would be the logical, you know, place for a study like that to take place. Mm -hmm. And then just, just personally, other than if, if, if you were to do this study and even if you were to, you know, um, uh, you know, just maybe consider or explore for other researchers who might be listening, who are looking for a good, you know, proposal to do this study, why would we put people into the DMT state for longer um, like what, what would the point of that be? Uh, well, it would be to characterize it, you know, to characterize that state, you know, to have, you know, people look around and interact with it. It's, you know, quite an interactive place. Certainly um, is. and there's not that much, you know, time to interact with the state, uh, when it's, you know, so brief, you know, so you could characterize the state much more carefully, um, uh, you can keep, you know, people in there for a couple hours, let's say, increase the dose, decrease the dose, you know, give them a break. Um, yeah. And, uh, you know, people would come back and say, yeah, this is what happened. And yeah, this is what seems to occur when I do this. You could test it. You can study that state. You could take a rock and hit it with a hammer in that state. And, you know, what happens? Uh, and you, you, you can't really do that with the big dose because it's you know, so disorienting and so brief. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you. The last question uh, that I have from patron here, which I think is a great question to finish off uh, the interview today is, um, 
uh, they ask that they would love to hear about any future studies you have planned and what you're working on currently. Now, they don't make a differentiation if they mean DMT specifically, so I'm just going to you know, interpret that as the open bore to you as to what you got coming up and what you're working on. Well, you know, my ex, you know, chairman, uh, you know, said to me one day, Rick, you're all over the map. Uh, <laughs> so I, I think that's where I am right now. Uh, you know, I'm co-editing with Andrew Gallimore actually, and a colleague in Hungary as well at Frexa. Um, a special research you know, topic for frontiers in pharmacology, and it's called psychedelic you know, drug research in the 21st uh, in uh, the in the 21st you know, century. Uh, you know, so I'm editing you know the manuscripts that are coming, and Andrew is and Ed is. You know, so that's you know taking up a lot of my time as you know reviewing the manuscripts, you know finding reviewers, uh, correspondence. Uh, and I'm also working on a colleague's translation from the Hebrew of a Spanish commentary on Ecclesiastes written 1,000 years ago. Hmm. You know, so I'm you know doing the copy editing on that project into English um, right now as well. You know, so those are the main things. I'm going to take a break from the blog. I'm looking around my room and seeing what else. I've got going. You know, those are the you know two main projects. I'll be, you know, completing the Ecclesiastes project in a couple more days, and then uh, I'm thinking I want to work on some fiction. Hmm. Um, you know, some amazing tales. You know, that kind of fiction. Uh, but uh, you know, I'll have to wait and see. Great. Well, uh, Rick, I want to thank you very much for offering us your time and your knowledge and your experience here today as well um just generally your your larger body of work uh over over the last several years uh, it's been a great contribution well thanks james it was fun is there uh, any uh, social media handles or uh, website tags or websites you'd like to send people to if they're interested in uh, getting involved more with your work uh, sure. Uh, you can contact me through either Facebook or my website, which is rickstrossman.com. Great. I'll make sure in the show notes uh, to this episode, which are always at jameswgesso.com, uh, that there are links uh, to your Facebook and your website, as well as links to the specific articles that I mentioned here in the interview and links to where you, the listener, <laughs> could buy copies of uh, Rick's books dmt the spirit molecule and dmt and the soul of prophecy rick thank you for being on the show thanks james well we have just turned the final pages on episode 65 here of adventures through the mind uh huge gratitude to rick for offering me his time and uh grappling some of those more complex questions with me. If you, the listener, have enjoyed this, uh, please consider sharing this podcast with a friend via social media or in some sort of way. Word of mouth is really the most excellent manner in which this podcast can grow, and uh, I would really appreciate that. If you're on YouTube, giving a thumbs up will ensure that more people see this video. And of course, if it's your first time tuning in, make sure that you subscribe here to the show that comes out every other Friday. Finally, as you are well familiar with, if you've been listening to this show for a while, or if you happen to participate in the whole intro, this show is brought to you by the community support of my patrons on Patreon, as well as the donations that are coming in from various people across the internet. If you like the show and would like to contribute to its production and distribution, I would also really like that as it is a contribution to uh, my capacity to commit to this continuously as a career choice. You can do so by heading to patreon.com forward slash James W. Gesso or by dropping a PayPal or cryptocurrency donation. Links to that are in the description to this episode. 
Thank you very much for tuning into episode 65 of the Adventures Through the Mind podcast. You can find more episodes at jameswgesso.com, and you can also follow me on social media at jameswgesso, Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. Thank you.